Good evening and welcome to this semester's final presentation of the Centennial Colloquial Series, focused on technology and society. I am Deb Buckman, Assistant Professor of Chemistry and Environmental Science, and I will serve as your moderator for this evening's presentation. The topic is Google Meets Aldo Leopold, Information, Technology, and the 21st Century Environmental Ethics. The two presenters are Dr. Rob Cooley and Dr. Mark Noy. Please make sure you have a note card and a pencil before the presentation begins. There will be a quiz. <laughs> Dr. Cooley is Assistant Professor of Anthropology and Environmental Science here at Penn College. He holds a doctorate in ecological anthropology from the University of Georgia. His undergraduate work was in biology at Bucknell University. Dr. Cooley has been at Penn College since 2003. Dr. Noy holds a doctorate from the University of Illinois in 19th century studies. His undergraduate work was done at Bradley University. Prior to coming to Penn College in 1999, Dr. Noy taught at the Air Force Academy and retired from there as a lieutenant colonel. Tonight's topic brings together one of the greatest authors on the environment, Aldo Leopold, and the 21st century technological giant, Google. Aldo Leopold is considered by many to be the father of wildlife management. He was one of the movers and shakers of the newly formed United States Forest Service in the early 1900s, and he is the author of the essay collection, A Sand County Almanac. As for Google, tonight's presentation will focus on Google Earth. Using Google Earth and the principles of environmental ethics, which Leopold espoused, the presenters will demonstrate how we can learn about our current environmental status. What better way to celebrate today, Earth Day? Dr. Cooley and Dr. Noy. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you. And welcome. Yes, thank you very much for coming. It's nice to see everybody here tonight. Let me see here. Do you wanna... there you go. Well, I often said when we were putting this together, we had a whole bunch of different threads to tie together. I felt like I was chasing an octopus sometime. But I think by the end of the night, you'll see how this all comes together. <laughs> One of the things that I really uh, appreciate and admire about Penn College is that we are a place that offers degrees that work. But that is so much more than knowing nuts and bolts. That's something that is, it, it's something about applied technology that requires balanced thinkers. We offer degrees. We offer bachelor's degrees and associate's degrees. And that means more than the technical courses. That means liberal arts courses. That means history. It means English. That means anthropology. It means so many different things that when the student walks out of our doors, they have a degree that works because they know how to put all the connections together. And that's why I feel, and many of my colleagues over uh, in, in the liberal arts section say, feel that Penn College degrees equal a true education. And I think that's what makes our students so unique and what I appreciate being a part of their education. <clears throat> we offer career broadening electives that um, <coughs> excuse me, we offer career broadening electives that connect the disciplines with the broader world. And when I think of the courses that I teach, like environmental science or anthropology, they're really a, a, re a diverse set of different elements that come together. When the student walks out the door, they have a completely different way of looking at things. And I think that's one of the main themes of what we're going to be doing tonight. Rob and I come out of different disciplines, but we we, uh, we both found that we have a, uh, a great appreciation for Aldo Leopold, and we, we wanted to see how we could connect Leopold and our disciplines. Um, I teach basic comp, comp one, uh, English 111. Uh, Rob teaches science 100, the environmental sciences course. But what we do is, uh, what we decided we wanted to do was try and marry these up and make connections beyond just those separate courses, uh, the kind of thing he was just talking about, uh, connecting beyond uh, the, the core or the disciplines, it's a, it's a college, and we wanted to bring all of that together. So here's the first quiz. 
I'd like you guys to grab your note cards and your pencils, and I'd like you to write down three definitions. We're going to work through this, and we're going to come back to this later on, so you need to do your homework now. <laughs> First thing, scribble down your note card what you think the environment is. A quick definition. Don't take too long. Just, just your quick ideas. Okay, and when you're done with that, the next one, this is getting a little harder, perspective. Tell me what you think perspective is. The last of the three, ethics. This is what I call in anthropology one of the squishier terms. What do you think ethics is? Okay, now before we roll on here, the tag that I want you guys to put in your minds as we go, as we progress, is this. How do these three terms relate? Hopefully we're going to show you how we think they relate, but I also want you to think in your, in your world, in your mind, how these three terms interact. Okay? All right. There we go. <coughs> okay. Um this is the guy we're, we're kind of celebrating tonight. Um, I'm not going to stand up here and give you a, a, a lengthy biography of uh, Aldo Leopold, but I want to give you at least a, a perspective of him. I'm going to do this by way of sort of an impressionistic approach. Uh, I'm going to, obviously, we'll, we'll look at how he is a forester, a professor, I think a fine writer, and notice, we put the next two together, hunter and ecologist, both. In, in a lot of instances, people kind of put those um, against one another, and I don't want to think that way. In fact, let me, uh, let me say that um, in my world, in, in teaching that basic composition course, it's, it is... Uh, it's the home of binary thinking. It's something that frustrates all of us who teach it because it's either A or B, zero, one, true, false, yes, no, black or white, there's no gray area. What, um, what the, the two ideas that uh, I, I just mentioned show, it's not hunter versus ecologist. It's hunter as ecologist. What, as his career progressed, what Leopold was able to do was see how the two worked together and, and helped each other. So that's, that's what we're, uh, we're going to try and work with, the getting beyond the binary thinking and um, recognizing, as he did, that understanding ecology meant better hunting. Um, now, to do that, um, we, both of us, make use of all of those assets that, that Leopold brings to the table. Um, and again, in my case especially, that uh, engaging prose, critical thinking and, and great prose. Um, for a few minutes here, uh, I'm sure some of you have read Leopold. 
Uh, some of you may have even brushed up on some Leopold before uh, the, uh, the evening's activity. Others, it may be something totally new to you. Well, we're going to go through a few examples, um, sort of an impressionistic biography of him and, uh, and through his writing, because that's how I got to know him. That's how I think it's easiest to get to know him. And and I'll caution you, yes, I am going to read some of that to you. But it's so you can get an idea of his thinking and a, a kind of a feel for his prose. So with that, um, he be, begins, the first excerpt I, I look at is uh, trying to bring art and physics together. I don't think that's as impossible as it might sound. The physics of beauty is one department of natural science still in the dark ages. Everybody knows, for example, that autumn landscape in the North Woods is land, plus a red maple, plus a ruffed grouse. In terms of conventional physics, the grouse represents only a millionth of either the mass or the energy of an acre. Yet subtract the grouse and the whole thing is dead. How? That you almost might think, okay, yeah, he's doing some binary thinking there. Wait a minute. But no, he isn't. As you read on, you see that he is getting far beyond grouse, no grouse. It's much bigger than that. And he does a much better job than that with it. Okay, here's another one. Um, this one is, um, is uh, <coughs> a little different. It's, he's uh, talking about being out in the West in the years that the environment was first, people were first beginning to pay some attention to it. In 1909, when I first saw the West, there were grizzlies in every major mountain mass, but you could travel for months without meeting a conservation officer. Okay, you know where this is going, right? Uh, today, there's some kind of conservation officer behind every bush, yet as wildlife bureaus grow, our most magnificent mammal retreats steadily toward the Canadian border. Okay, he continues. There seems to be a tacit assumption that if grizzlies survive in Canada and Alaska, that is good enough. It is not good enough for me. The Alaskan bears are a distinct species. Relegating grizzlies to Alaska is about like relegating happiness to heaven. One may never get there. Okay. You, you, again, maybe there's some binary there, but he goes way beyond it. And, and you may notice um, in, that, uh, in that last line just a little bit of subtle wit. Uh, this is one of the things that uh, uh, I find to be a, a uh, defining mark of Aldo Leopold, uh, the fact that he's able to, to be witty about what he considers very serious things. Okay, which... Um, my next example is going to do, deal with extensively. Uh, he, uh, when he first moved to Wisconsin, um, left the government service and went up there to, to uh, work for the University of Wisconsin, he, um, he set up, uh, bought a little chunk of land uh, that included a shed, and he set it up as the family retreat. And it, it never really grew. It got a little neater, but, uh, but he took over the territory, the land, and he reclaimed it. Among other things, he put a, uh, a, a bench and table, a little homemade bench and table out there uh, near the, the shed, and, uh, or as, he, as the family called it, the shack. And he would go out there in the morning, early morning, 3, 3.30, 4 o'clock, with his notebook. And he was known for keeping meticulous, detailed notebooks. And he would, with his notebook, start tracking animals as they began making their calls in the morning. He'd, he'd have his notebook there, he'd have some binoculars for when it got lighter, and he'd have his coffee pot. Getting up too early is a vice habitual in horned owls, stars, geese, and freight trains, he wrote. Some humans acquire the habit from geese and some coffee pots from hunters. 
Uh, again, this is, this is one of those lines. It comes in, uh, in the October section of, of the Almanac, which is about the first third of the book. And uh, it's one of the lines that really caught me. If nothing had before, this certainly did. Uh, and again, there's that humor in there. Um, he, uh, he did the same thing in, this is a longer excerpt uh, in, in one of the later essays, but here he's talking about his uh, philosopher dog. And uh, dog owners understand that well, I'm sure. Uh, Partridge scent is the gold standard that relates my dog's world to mine. My dog, by the way, thinks I have much to learn about partridges, and being a professional naturalist, I agree. He persists in tutoring me with the calm patience of a professor of logic in the art of drawing deductions from an educated nose. I delight in seeing him deduce a conclusion in the form of a point from data that are obvious to him, but speculative to my unaided eye. Perhaps he hopes his dull pupil will one day learn to smell. (laughs) He continues, Like other dull pupils, I know when the professor is right, even though I do not know why. I check my gun and walk in. Like any good professor, the dog never laughs when I miss, which is often. He gives me just one look and proceeds up the stream in quest of another bird. (coughs) The the teacher in me loves the last couple of of lines there. Okay. um, This, uh, my, my introduction to Aldo Leopold and a Sand County Almanac was... Uh, about 20 years ago, um, I was at a literary conference, of all things, in uh, mid-state uh, Wisconsin, um, UW-Stevens Point. On the, the edge of that town is a nature preserve and uh, dedicated to Leopold. And I discovered it, a couple of us did, and, and we spent more of the conference time probably than we should have out hiking its trails, enjoying the enjoying the out of doors. Um, and I came back from that wondering how I can incorporate Leopold into courses. And I never, it took a long time for me to figure something out. Um, when I moved here about 15 years ago, uh, I continued to do that. I started taking sentences or paragraphs and occasionally an entire essay and having students read it, respond to it. Um, all the while, I began buying up copies of the book. I, I, I'm an aficionado of used book sales, and, and so I would, uh, I would buy a copy when I'd see one, hand it out to uh, uh, students I thought might be interested. And uh, along the way, somewhere uh, after, after Rob arrived, um, we began to get acquainted, uh, sat a committee or two together, and I came back from a sale one time with one of the <coughs> books and um, thought, well, maybe, maybe Rob would like this. So I went looking for him. Uh, my original copy there is on the right, but uh, uh, pristine in comparison to the other one, you'll notice. Uh, but I took one about like it to, uh, to Rob, and, uh, and I said, hey, uh, uh, you know this guy's work? Uh, interested in a free copy of of this book and he gave me a funny smile i certainly did because this book is actually um <coughs> excuse me this book is actually one of the most probably one of the most important books in terms of setting me down a path um in college i i majored in biology and going to college starting out in college, Mark was talking about binary thinking. My thinking was, if I can do biology and ecology, and taking a first ecology course, one of the, one of the books as the book reading list was Leopold San County Almanac. I read that thing from cover to cover a couple of times. I went, this is fantastic. This is awesome stuff. I'm going to save the world. And needless to say, as I got further along in my studies, I went, eh, it's kind of more complicated than that. 
but you know, the Lorax, Dr. Seuss's book, um, something I've read for years since I was a little kid, and kind of that little nugget clicking with Leopold and clicking with the, my growing understanding of the interconnections of the environment and ecology and, and the role of humans in it. Um, you know, binary thinking at first, hey, save the world. If we could just get rid of all the people, we could fix all of our problems. Yeah, that's not going to work. So, uh, you know, I got reading Leopold and thinking about the dynamics of humans and the environment in the long term, the depth of it. And I started coming to the, the second conclusion. Well, you don't manage resources, you manage the people that harvest the resources. And that's where it gets complicated because we all know that people are weird, right? <laughs> people do things that don't make sense. And so I went on to grad school in anthropology, ecological anthropology to be exact, which is even more hard to explain. But the point is, looking at the role of humans in the environment is one of these multi-layered perspectives that requires thinking from the top, from the bottom, from the inside, from the out, upside down and backwards, and drawing on e economics and political science and history and ecology and engineering and culture and religion and all these different things. And I went, wow. Perspective is what it's all about. And that's why I've taken, I really enjoyed this project with Mark, is bringing Leopold into my environmental science classroom has allowed me to emphasize the, the idea of perspective and thinking outside the box. Too often we see on TV or in the news these proverbial lines in the sand where there's one group for and one group against and all they do is argue back and forth and kick the ball back and forth and never, never see what the other side is seeing. But if you say, hey, wait. I can see your point and your point. Let's talk about this. That's where things hopefully get done. So by bringing these concepts into my environmental science class, and more than just definitions, we're going to wrap these into Leopold as we go on. So I need one volunteer to tell me what they think the environment is. Anybody? How about over here in the blue sweatshirt? Pardon? The world and the things in it. Exactly. And that is, as, for lack of a better term, as global a definition as we can get. And that's great, because truly it is everything that's in it. Now, just a quick show of hands. When I said environment, and you wrote down your definition, how many folks imagine the environment to be something outside this building? But think about it. We're breathing air right now, right? And this, this what's that? Oh. I mean, I have my hand because yes. It was, just, it was just a show of hands. You're, it, it's all right, thanks. Um, but the, the environment is, this room was created out of raw materials from the environment, correct? The air we breathe, the electricity that is powering all these wonderful things to make tonight happen. So our built environment is part of the environment. So it's just a matter of how you look at it. So, yeah, everything that affects an organism during its lifetime is the way we talk about an environmental science class, which is way different than outside-inside. Then it gets complicated, right? Exactly. Second one. I need another volunteer. Tell me what perspective is. Uh, the point of view of something... Uh, no, the point of view something has on an object or situation... Exactly, the point of view that you have on a particular object or a situation. And that can change depending on who you are, where you are in time, the things that are going on around you, right? Your values, your religious perspectives, your family perspectives, your economic perspectives. All these things influence how you might take an issue. And that, of course, makes things complicated, which in my opinion is good. Because the more you think about things, the more you can see the nuances of all the different sides of an issue, rather than black or white. And that's what Leopold was all about. Now, the last one, ethics. Somebody over here. Anybody? Mortals. Wait. <coughs> Mortals. Wait, what does this say? I forget. Morals and principles. Morals, Morals and principles you believe in. Good job. That's my son, John. <laughs> morals and principles that you believe in. Yes, and you get your morals and your principles from a variety of sources, right? And again, they can come from where you live, they can come from your religion, they can come from your cultural background. There's any number of ways that you can bring values to how you choose to utilize resources, right? So when we talk about environmental issues in my class, it's never black and white. 
And it always comes back to these three terms. So, good. You all passed the quiz. <laughs> so, the idea of relating these is just thinking about how we can stack them to, from top to bottom, going from, you know, the top level perspective to, to deep inside an issue. Now, I want you to think about how our environmental perspective has changed historically. Now, these are obviously major simplifications, but think about it. If you landed on the shores of North America in the 15th century, and from the 15th century through the 1700s, what tools would you have to visualize what lay in front of you? Would you have an airplane? Helicopters? Satellites? Pretty much, you'd have your eyeballs and your feet. And I don't know if any of you like to hike, but a mile in the woods is a long way. Right? Especially when you're going up the mountains around here. But a mile in the woods back then, when Native Americans ruled the continent, right? They were the first inhabitants here. And this is what you saw. How vast would the European perspective of natural resources and expansion and industrialization and all that stuff that came with it over those 1600, 1700, 1800s, how vast would this continent seem? It would seem completely inexhaustible. And it was culturally appropriate to view that as in a utilitarian sense, say, hey, we can use this to grow an economy, to build a nation, to build a society. And there was no need to worry about limits because the environment absorbed whatever humans threw at it at the time. I call it seeing with our feet. But we get towards the middle, the, the, the middle of the industrial age. We get to the, let's say, the, the 19th century. Think about the Williamsport millionaires, right? Where the Williamsport millionaires, because of the lumber industry, because of the industrial growth that was afforded by the vast timber resources of this area. And then after that, the, the steel uh, industries and all, that, all the growth related to that. The Industrial Age is kind of a point where the American society as a nation reached coast to coast, reached its modern boundaries, and again, it's, it's an oversimplification, but I look at it as they reached the other side of the continent and looked back and went, oh wow, look what we did. And some of it was great, some of it was not so great, depending on you know, which side of things you were on, but from an environmental perspective, People realize now that there were limits, there were boundaries, and there were, had been some pretty big mistakes along the way. And one of the sort of the themes that shows up, and especially in the 1920s and 30s, when Aldo Leopold was being in the height of his career as a forester for the Forest Service, was the, the goal to set aside and conserve. And at the time, it wasn't ecosystem management and sustainable forestry and sustainable uh, you know, fisheries and, and the idea of integrated pest management and all the really high-tech, highly complex ways of understanding sustainability that we have today. It was more, hey, let's, let's set this aside because if we don't, somebody else is going to take it or it's not going to be there by the time we're done. So this is the time when Roosevelt and John Muir here in this picture, Gifford Pinchot from Pennsylvania, um, when, when all these folks are setting aside our national parks. So when you think about Yellowstone, when you think about the Grand Canyon, when you think about all these wonderful places that we have today, they were essentially established during this time period. So we kind of got to the other side and went, okay, now what? Hmm. Maybe we should leave these things just in case we need them in the future. Plus, they're really cool and really pretty, too. <laughs> so seeing with our feet, now we're starting to have some technology. We've got better maps. We're, we're starting to, we ha we've kind of reached the other side, and okay, we retrace our steps and lay it all out. But things, again, get complicated in terms of our perspective and understanding when we hit the space age. I call it information overload. In the early 20th century, I'm talking 1930s, 1940s, we started to be able to see the Earth from a perspective that you can't see with the human body. We started to send cameras up high over the earth and look down and take pictures. And it's one thing to hike a mile, and it's another thing to look at it on a map. And it's another thing still to look at it on the internet and satellite imagery. You ever taken a hike and then go back and look where you went? It's fantastic. You're like, oh yeah, I remember that rock, I remember that creek. We didn't start seeing that until the middle of the 20th century. And even then, there was really primitive pictures like, wow, you can see the earth as a whole. Think about this picture right here. This is probably one of the first times that 
human beings in the modern world saw the earth as a whole, single system. So going from seeing with our feet and kind of parting the rhododendrons and looking at a rushing stream to be able to look at the whole planet all at one, hmm, it's interesting when you think about it like that. Because then you start seeing, hey, not only have we gone from coast to coast or you know, gone from continent to continent, but human beings as a species have now gone global. We've reached every corner of the planet. So the information overload that was spawned by the space age, I should check my text while I'm at it. Just kidding. The information overload that we have here is because of things like this. You know, when you think about, I've got to get back through all my things here. When you think about all the stuff that we have here, there's probably more computing power in these than we have in some of the earliest spacecraft that, spacecraft that went into orbit and went to the moon. There's more computing power in this than was in my Intellivision video game system when I was a kid. And yet, me, myself included, Facebook, email, a couple of forums, the weather, my checkbook. How boring. And how shallow. There's so much more we can get out of this. What do you check daily, hourly, all the time? Right? Minecraft. <laughs> that's, a, that's exactly it. So when you think about it, even though we have all this technology at our fingertips, we still think with our feet in a lot of ways. We still, it, a lot of times we don't put all the pieces together that we can. And again, that's sort of my, my, one of my goals or my objectives in my classes is to try to help us take that extra step and put these things together. So building perspective through teaching in environmental science and anthropology, blending Aldo Leopold into all this. Slow down and dig deep. Instead of just you know, looking at things really quickly and looking at one thing at a time, let's go back and see what people in the past said and how does that relate to now? I mean, a lot of you chuckled listening to Leopold's comments. So they still resonate, they still ring true. And when you think about today, even though he wrote that in 1930, 1940, still has a lot of meaning today. And he was one of the first people to really think about ecology as a set of systems that all interact together. Because in his time, we were looking at people as being the managers and the masters of ecosystems, rather than just a part of the fabric. So by looking back and reading the classics, we can get some perspective. But we can also look ahead and we can Google it. How many of you have been in a conversation with somebody, they asked you a question, you didn't know the answer, said, so, wait a minute. Happened to me the other night. And then I realized that the four of us in the room were all racing to come up with the answer first. It was like, and one was at Wikipedia. No, Wikipedia doesn't count. <laughs> so, you know, but Googling it, I mean, what did we do without Google? It's, 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 a, it's, it's a reflexive thing now that we just do. But you can't just look at stuff on the Internet. Sometimes you just physically have to go there, whether it's going for a hike, going for a walk, going for a drive, going fishing, or better yet, a little shameless plug here, studying abroad. What better experience to have than to go to a completely different culture or country and see how they do things? It's a very valuable experience, and Penn College has quite a variety of these types of experiences. But tonight, since we can't all get on a plane and fly somewhere, we're going to use Google to go on a virtual field trip. So hopefully, I can take you on a virtual field trip, more or less, around the whole planet in a few minutes here. So let me get going. Okay. Are you guys ready? Now, the first thing I want to do is to, to show you a little bit of what I think is some perspective of where we are. Obviously, this is Pennsylvania. This is where we are existing right now. But when you look at this landscape, and we're 2,692 miles above Earth in this image, I can see from here, and you can too, the impact of human activity from 2,000 miles up. Every white dot that you see is an urban area. Because every white dot reflects pavement and blacktop. And as you zoom in, the closer you get, the more this patchwork quilt of humanity shows up. I need a little blinking light that says, you are here. So here's Williamsport. Here's where we are tonight for our, our time together. But when you look at Williamsport, you see streets, and you see parking lots, and bridges, and, and infrastructure, and you see farm fields, and 
a patchwork quilt. But when you go north and you get into the state forest, things quiet down a little bit. And we get up towards one of my favorite places, Rock Run and the McIntyre Wild Area and uh, the Old Logger's Path and Maston. But when you look at, at this area, I was a little low there. When you look at this area today, and this is the Lowell Sox State Forest, it's still a relatively intact piece of wooded uh, landscape. Now keep in mind, all of this was clear cut during the logging days. So this has been regrown. This is not a pristine wilderness. These dark green spots that you see on top are old strip mines back in the bituminous coal days of Ralston and the Glenburn Colliery. But for today, it's one of the last chunks of relatively undisturbed woods we have in this region. But as you scroll back, Zooming out again for perspective, because if you're walking around in, in this area, you could walk for a long, long time and just be slogging through the woods. It seems infinite. But if you zoom out and just go across the creek, this is like Coleman Creek, there's a brand new wind turbine project here. If you scroll back a little further, you see fields. If you roll down a little bit, you can see the new roads and, and uh, infrastructure for the Marcellus industry. And if you roll down more, you can see Route 15, farm fields, the urban area. So you can be, you can zoom in on somebody's house. You can zoom in all the way uh, downtown there. Or you can look at it from space. It really depends on what you want. But what I use this for in my class is to demonstrate, the, well, it's, it's basically to give support to the cliche, a uh, picture is worth a thousand words, right? You ever heard that? Well, when we talk about climate change and anthropogenic impacts on the environment, it's one thing to say, hey, the polar ice caps are being influenced in their extent by warming global temperatures. It's another thing to show data from 1978 to 2013. The pink represents the average, or not average, the median sea ice extent. So watch what happens when we hit play. You can actually see periods of warming years reducing the extent of sea ice. Of course, it's not loading up properly right now, but that's the trouble you do when you do things live. You never know what, what, what might happen. If I zoom back, we'll do it again. If you watch, you can actually see how the pink area, which is sort of the, the median extent, becomes greater than the overall ice extent as time goes on. 99, 2000, 2001. And now it starts to get really dramatically small in 2011 and 10. And we end up with this which is probably a third less than when we started 20 years ago. So uh, climate change and polar ice caps is kind of like the back of your head. You know it's there, but you can't see it. But if you can show and then have students research and do, it takes it to a whole new level. Well, talking about climate change, let's go to a place that's closer to home. Anybody like the Chesapeake Bay? It's good for crabs and uh, seafood but it's also a huge wildlife habitat. If you go down to the eastern shore of, of, and the, the southeastern corner of Maryland before you get down the Damarva Peninsula, um, there's a place called the Blackwater Wildlife Refuge. And what's interesting about this place is that it's very low to the ground. Uh, it's only a few feet above sea level. Um, it's a 30,000-ish acre uh, national wildlife refuge. In 30 years, it has lost 16% of its area because of four inches of sea level rise, four inches. Now, it doesn't sound like much, you know, four inches, big deal. You lose a couple feet, right? Well, when you lose 16% of 30,000 acres, we're talking 5,000 lost acres, and that shows up in the blue. The blue is inundated areas. As you zoom up and then zoom back. Come on now. There we go. You can actually see the blue areas expand. And what that means is lost habitat over time for migratory waterfowl. I mean, it's home to thousands and thousands of migratory seabirds every year. We can talk about land use planning. Um, and before we, well, well, we'll do this first. I'm sure you read in the news the, um, about the landslide in Washington State recently, right? The tragic landslide where a lot of people lost their lives. Unfortunately, this landslide was totally predictable. We didn't know exactly when it would happen, but it was pretty much a guarantee that it would. Here's why. If you go back to 1989, you can actually see 
This is the community that got um, overrun by the landslide. This is the river, and it's meandering through the floodplain like rivers are supposed to do. But you notice here that there, there, there's some kind of land use going on, whether it's forestry or something else, but the, what happened was somehow that hillside got destabilized. And you notice we had a small landslide. See how the river is now flat around this bend instead of pointy? We'll move it forward just a little bit further, and we notice that you know, it's kind of recovered a little bit. But notice there's very few houses built in here, maybe one or two. This is 2005. There's 2006. Did you see what happened? We had a major landslide. And as of yet, there weren't a whole lot of houses built here. The whole river was cut off. 2006, 2007, 2008, all the way to 2014, basically things quiet down. And then in 2014, in March, this whole hillside let go and flowed over the river and over this community of homes that were built after that landslide in 2006. One could say there's a disconnect, perhaps, between planning, policy, zoning, and science in some cases. And this is a good example of starting a discussion about perspective. How long is a year or two, in your opinion, if no landslides happen, if you're living there? Seems like a long time, right? You can forget about the past in a year or two. Remember Tropical Storm Lee and flooding in Montoursville? 2011, that seems like decades ago. If you forget, um, and, and it's easy to make decisions that can have catastrophic consequences. <clears throat> um, so, and we talk about air pollution a lot, too, in environmental science. And it's easy to talk about air pollution and talk about the air pollution of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. Say, hey, you know, Pittsburgh and Donora, Pennsylvania experienced fatal smog events that killed people. Well, it's one thing to say, hey, we got, you know, bad air quality. And it's another thing to show it. Modern China today is an industrializing nation that is going through what the United States uh, went through as well. And they're experiencing the same kind of growing pains environmentally as the United States did. If you look at air quality pollution, I'm sure when the Beijing Olympics were held, you heard about air quality. If you look at the air quality here, you can actually see the difference. You can see the, the air pollution from vehicles and industry right over, over the top. If you want to talk about land use, let's go to Las Vegas. Anybody like Las Vegas? Las Vegas is an interesting city because it's in the middle of the desert, and it's kind of unusual to find millions of people living in a desert because people need a lot of what to live? Water, right? So to locate a city that needs millions of, ga millions of gallons of water a day in the middle of the desert seems kind of precarious. So here's the 1970s Las Vegas. Here's Vegas in 2000. Here's Vegas in 2006. Vegas grew 80% in the 2000s. It grew from, you know, it grew up to almost 2 million people. 80% in the, that time frame also combined with a large drought, which has dropped Lake Mead, I think, almost 100 feet. It's at some point that we're going to see water issues in places like this. We could talk about land use in my home state of Delaware. Middletown, Delaware is a classic example of a town that was uh, surprised by development. In the early 1980s, Middletown was a cornfield, uh, I'm sorry, cornfield. Pretty much it was mostly cornfields and soybeans in Middletown, Delaware. And a small highway that connected it with the northern part of the state. Middletown, Delaware, for those of you who have never been there, is kind of mid-state. Here's Wilmington, Baltimore, Philadelphia. But when you zoom in on Middletown, you see something interesting happen. When you drag the slider up to the 2000s, and we get better imagery, what we're starting to see is, notice here, we got all this cornfields, all this agricultural space. When you get a big highway, here's New Delaware Route 1, easy access to northern Delaware. What do we start to see in the rural agricultural areas around the town? And those who live in this area know about the traffic and the amount of driving that one has to do to get anywhere. Again, the idea of if you connect it with transportation, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Now, there's lots of local things that we can do here with, with Google Earth, too, that are fascinating. Anybody who lives here knows that in the fall, when the leaves start to turn, 
the mountaintops go first, right? You can actually see that from space. You can see here that the mountains are green around their flanks, around their base, and the ridge tops are deep orange and red. And you can actually get a handle on the timing of the fall color as it changes throughout the season. Now, anybody who knows me knows I like to fish, and I also like to stare at maps. And anybody in my class knows that for a fact. <laughs> but when I look at the river and look at the river in Williamsport, the river tells so many different stories. If I zoom in here, you can see in Williamsport, for one, I've got to get rid of this historical imagery so we can see well. All right. You can see the old dam that still has the sluice way for the log rafts to go through. You can see the cribs from the lumber boom where they stacked up the logs for grading and sending to market. And you can actually follow those cribs all the way up to Nesbitt, all the way around the bend here, past the Hiawatha, past Nesbitt, and around the bend. It gives you an idea of the scale of the logging industry. Miles of river blocked up to store logs. But when you follow the river, you look back a little bit and you say, wow, you know, what did this do? Well, the lumber industry, for one. But if you follow the river down to its confluence with the North Branch in Sunbury, another interesting story emerges. If you zoom in here, do you notice that the left side of the river in this picture is a dark bluish green and the right side is a brownish color? What you're seeing here is the confluence of two different, e two different river systems. The left branch drains, drains an agricultural area, so the water's in fairly good shape. The north branch drains Wilkesbury, Scranton, the Wyoming Valley, and the anthracite region of Pennsylvania. And it's bringing a load of acid mine drainage into the Susquehanna River. And what's fascinating about this is if you move down, you can see it takes miles for those two, two flows to fully mix. But if you go back to Sunbury, you can actually see where Shimokin Creek merges with the Susquehanna River. And if you've ever been to Shimokin, you know Shimokin is one of the biggest anthracite towns in the region. But it also has Shimokin Creek, which, zooming out like this, you can follow all the way through Palmyra and Snydertown. And when you get to Shimokin, you can see kind of its source. All these are coal mines up here. And this is the, the, the residual land use that's left over from the anthracite days. But we also see from 10,000 feet an orange creek going through the right through the middle of town. And this is the story of acid mine drainage in Pennsylvania, and another water quality thing we talk about. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about geology a little bit, environmental science too, one of the neat things with Google Earth is you can take people places and show them things. I can show them a, an anticline in the Lock Haven formation of, of rock right on Route 15 north. This is near the Hepburnville exit on Route 15 if you go north. And so we can talk about the geology of the area, the layers of s s sediment and how they all form together. We can talk about historical stuff too. If you go to uh, and thinking about geology, thinking about timber, thinking about natural resources, we can think about the human imprint that that's left. If you go out to Jersey Shore and look at Jersey Shore Steel, which is now a place where they recycle large amounts of steel and make different products, Jersey Shore Steel's plant is on the site of the old New York Central Railroad um, shops. And you can still see the footprint of the roundhouse where the steam locomotives were kept. And again, it's just the imprint that wasn't that long ago, and yet the black and white pictures of steam locomotives carrying timber out of our woods seem far, far away. And yet the footprint is still there to this day. We could go out and see it tomorrow if you wanted to. Um, PA has a long history of energy and natural resources, and what makes PA, PA an interesting state to live in, but it also is what makes for its challenges. You know, so when you think about land use, when you think about the, um, the challenges that we have with fragmentation, if you look at this slide here, what you're looking at, the dark green are the mountains. It's too steep to really do anything on these things, but the areas that are flat have been developed for agriculture, for energy, for urban activities. But even when you get up into the northern tier where it's fairly rural, just about every square inch of flat land has been dedicated for some kind of productive purpose. And that's what makes what we do interesting around here. But it's also the challenge because what we have left, coming back to where we started, what we have left in Lawsock State Forest and Tide Otten State Forest are resources and treasures that we need to make sure that we use and choose our activities in wisely. So, whether we're talking about 
ghost towns. By the way, there's dozens of ghost towns across Pennsylvania. There's a town in, in coal country, Centralia, that has been on fire since the 1960s, underground. Um, you can see the footprint of the streets, but all the people had to leave because the ground was collapsing in underneath them as the mine fire consumed the coal. There's a ghost town just south of the mountain here in Allenwood called Alvira. It's a town that was a very small agricultural town that the federal government bought in pre-World War II and turned into a TNT manufacturing town. And the bunkers are still there. Um, and there's even Maston, PA, which is just north of here, which is an old CCC camp uh, where there was a, a mill that made clothespins from the, from the wood resources that were there. So there's, there's, as you can tell, each one of these things we could talk about for a whole semester in, in some ways. There's so many things to talk about. But what I would like to challenge you guys to do is to, I would like to challenge you to think about what you can use this for. In a way, now it's your turn. And in order to uh, uh, get there, to let you contemplate that a little bit, uh, we're going to leave you with, with one more little bit from Aldo Leopold himself. Uh, perhaps the most often quoted line from Leopold. Um, he, uh, in, uh, <coughs> in the uh, time of just over a century ago, he was in the American Southwest, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and he was uh, head of a, a forestry team, a crew. He was in his early 20s yet, but, uh, and some of the crew were much older, more experienced. But he was the boss, and, and he went out and uh, did what crews do. I mean, they were doing their forestry work, uh, but they, in the process of doing that, any time they would run across a... a uh, a number of wolves, then that would, uh, that would be an opportunity. Standard operating procedure was kill them. And um, in later years, he would reflect on that moment being the time that he understood it's not just either or. We need balance. We need something more than that. And so we get his statement in reflection I was young then and full of trigger itch, I thought, because fewer wolves meant more deer that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. What happened was the crew saw a bunch of wolves off on the hillside adjacent, and they opened up. And when they finished, they went down the hill and up the other side, and uh, they'd killed many, uh, wounded some, driven off the rest. But there was one, it was a mother of several cubs who was part of the group, that was lying there dying. And uh, one of the phrases from this line becomes totally connected with Aldo Leopold. It's, uh, it's his description of what he saw when he looked at her. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. That fierce green fire became the title of at least one of the biographies of Leopold. It, it, again, it became associated with him because it meant something. When he looked back, he said, you know, it's not just killing the, deer, the, uh, the wolves. It's what that means to the rest of the mountain. And that is what we'll leave you with. He decided, in retrospect, that was the point he learned, the need for balance, the, the need for multiple perspectives, and we get, uh, again, his words to finish our evening's activity. I now suspect that just as a deer herd lives in mortal fear of its wolves, so does a mountain live in mortal fear of its deer. Thank you. On behalf of the audience, I thank my two colleagues for their informa informative, thoughtful, and thought-provoking presentation. They are ready now. We have a few minutes to take questions. If you raise your hand, a microphone will come your way to ensure that everyone hears your question. So, anybody got a question?
No questions. You did a good job. Thank you. Uh, I lived in New Mexico for a while where well, Aldo Leopold uh, was a national forester in the Carson, and uh, there was a stretch of land there called the Via of it all, 100,000 acres that was, uh, was given to the government by Pennzoil Corporation. And uh, when the government did not have the mineral rights, Pennzoil kept them, I believe, or sold them. And when uh, they went to get those rights, the uh, community, the whole state, which is a very divided state politically, much like Pennsylvania, uh, got behind preserving the vibe at all. And it was mainly preserved because a very powerful Democratic senator, a very powerful Republican senator, agreed, and so did the rest of the delegation. And I wonder if we could try to save the uh, Rock Run area by uniting in this county politically and socially and educationally, Penn College especially, and try to pull something like that off. What do you think? <laughs> well, obviously that's one of those complicated, multi-layered issues. And um, the best thing that I can say is that because Penn College students have a diverse educational experience, they can come out of here best prepared to participate in these types of situations, knowing, thinking about both sides of the, of the issue. It's applying knowledge and it's talking. That, that's that's the, the thing. The tools you have. Uh, I'm asking this because a month ago I would have not known it. Could you c expand a little bit about what happened when they brought the wolves back? Okay. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can share a little bit about what the just thing. What you left it with was nice and emotional, but you left out, from my perspective, the best part of the story. Sure. Well, as you know, wolves are a predator, and they tend to eat herbivores, like deer. Basically, if you have too many lawnmowers, there's going to be nothing for the lawnmowers to mow, right? So if you have something that's going to take out the lawnmowers or keep the lawnmowers at the right amount, then the grass will grow at just the right amount to keep everything balanced. And the idea is that wolves are kind of a cap that keeps the optimal number of herbivores or deer in the system so that the mountain itself can have the right balance of primary production or vegetation. And by going through, but, but if you're a rancher, if you've got sheep or if you've got cattle, wolves are your number one enemy because they're, they're eating up your bottom line, right? So at the time, you know, when Leopold and, and his crews were going out and shooting wolves, they were doing their duty to protect the, the material and economic interests of people who were developing the landscape. That was a good thing and a smart thing to do at the time based on their understanding of the ecosystem. But what happened was they basically got rid of all the, lawn, all, all the predators and all of a sudden, there were way too many lawnmowers, and the, the deer and the herbivores in those regions basically ate the landscape completely, and they, the ranchers found themselves with no forage for their animals to eat. So the system got out of balance, and I think where he says that the, the mountain lived in fear of its deer, with no predators, there's too many deer, the mountain is going to get shaved bare. But if you have the right balance of predator-prey relationships, then everything acts accordingly. So I think from an ecological standpoint, I think that's kind of what you were getting at. Um, One of the specific things that uh, Leopold said in that particular segment was that uh, when you see um, uh, vegetation eaten up to about an eight-foot level, you have hungry deer. They have to be on their hind legs to do that, and that right. means there's not enough out there. Right, yeah. exactly. There's a question in the back. You have that great quote um, from Leopold about the conservation officer, and I was just wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit more about his interpretation and his viewpoints on conservation agencies and also where he might stand today on some of the kind of growing structures of some of those agencies. The Unfortunately, it's, it's the whole book you almost have to get into to get to that. 
he, he was a marginally successful conservation officer early in his career. He had a couple of bosses who nurtured him along. He got better as time went by at both managing, as I said earlier, much older crews quite often, much more experienced crews. He had the theory, he had the degree, but he didn't have the experience. Uh, as he got better at it, and as he, he had time to reflect on things, that's when he started looking back, I think, and, and um, opening up the perspectives. He, again, he followed the letter initially, but he began to change it later, and, and he was simultaneously working as a uh, conservation or a forestry official and working with various wilderness organizations and uh, animal organizations. So he was, he was very mixed. And the, the further along he got, the more he was concerned that y you can't just approach it according to the book. I'm, I don't know if that answers your question, but, but it, uh, the, the more you get into, uh, especially the essays after the, um, the almanac itself, you start to see the, the multiplication of things going on and, and how they connect. Yeah. That's all the time we have. So uh, again, I want to thank you to, for coming this evening. A few reminders, please deposit your pencil in the box provided at the front hallway, unless you have a need for it, of course, as you exit the auditorium. And please do join the presenters in the Rapture Cafe again. where refreshments will be served. <clears throat> uh, you will have an opportunity to con continue conversations with tonight's presenters. Rapture Cafe is downstairs on the first floor behind the auditorium. And uh, there will be copies of Sand County Almanac. It's just like regular class. Yep. And the Centennial Colloquial will continue next semester with two faculty presentations and a presentation by Dr. Alan Lightman, a physicist, a novelist, and the author of Einstein's Dream. Have a good evening. <laughs>